Many of you had occasion to listen to African heads of states in Sham el Sheikh in Egypt talking about climate change. And almost all of them were worried about funding. Funding continues to worry Africa in all sectors. HIV AIDS has been with us for the last 40 years and remains with us. When COVID came, we almost forgot about HIV AIDS. It is only those who are intimately involved with it and are in the front line, such as doctors and researchers that were aware that HIV AIDS continues to be a burden to our economies and to our households here in Uganda and in the continent of Africa and in the world, but in a much more pronounced sense in the continent of Africa. We now have Ebola here in Uganda and we are aware of the great efforts that are being made to ensure that it is tackled. But yet the impact of HIV AIDS remains alive in our communities, coupled with the stigma that accompanies it. We are also aware is that it is our friends of goodwill who continue to support us. The Americans are doing so, and we have to appreciate them. But the question is, for how long will they continue to support us? The UN, in which we are a member but contribute very little, is also supporting us. So there is a sense in which we are in a crisis. Those who come in to support do so on the assumption that their contribution will be time sensitive. And when they come in, they come in in the hope that they have an exit strategy. But several years down the line, we now know that even our friends of goodwill are getting fatigued, even if they don't say so. And even if they say so, mutedly. But we know that they are getting tired. And the time is now that we in the African continent must begin to look inwards. We cannot be a continent whose greatest claim to fame is begging. That cannot be the thing that defines us. Many times I imagine to myself that if our public officials, right from the president to ministers, visit the Chinese, the Americans, the British and others, even when you begin a conversation, they must be asking themselves, but when will they begin begging? That is the reality. And the time is now that we must liberate ourselves from that cast of begging. And that is why I understand that this conversation this morning is beginning to ask the right question. Not that we have never asked this question before. Those of you who are students of things that happen in Africa will remember that as early as 1980 in Lagos, Nigeria, 
African heads of state sought under the Lagos Plan of Action. And if you look at the fine print of the Lagos Plan of Action, one of the things that preoccupied the continent at that time is how can we begin to engage with each other so that we are capable of solving our problems as the continent of Africa. Several years down the line, we are not far off from where we began. And one would say that perhaps the Lagos plan of action was not as targeted as it should have been. In 2001 in Abuja, under the Abuja protocol, African heads of states and government once again made a commitment that the continent of Africa, each country in the continent of Africa would dedicate 15% of their budget for health. I can report to you that not a single African country has reached that. Perhaps statistics show us that Tanzania tried, that Botswana tried, that Seychelles tried, that Mauritius tried. But the truth is very little money is dedicated to our health departments with the consequence that in areas such as HIV AIDS, if you go to almost all African countries, the support we have is heavily skewed and it is through donor support. I'm told here in Uganda, over 80% of your budget is covered by donors. And other African countries not shy of the 80%. And I can tell you that if it is supported in that manner, it cannot be sustained. Because the truth is be told, he who pays the piper calls the tune still makes sense. The truth be told, there is no free lunch. Even when we are supported in those areas, there are always strings attached. The strings may be invisible, but they are there. And the time is now for us to smell the coffee as the cliche goes. But sometimes I suspect in Africa that even our sense of smell is dead. So that we are incapable of smelling that proverbial coffee. And the time is now for us to ask ourselves, how can we liberate ourselves from this dependence? I know you are worried about Uganda. But Uganda cannot exist in spite of the region because HIV AIDS is not constrained to the borders. What happens in the Democratic Republic of Congo and the movement of peoples will affect what you are doing here in Uganda. You cannot ignore what is happening in South Sudan. You cannot ignore what is happening in the region as long as we are mobile. And if we thought that you could control it within Uganda, I see the Ugandans are making promises to themselves and I do not begrudge them that by the year 2030, uh, HIV will have been eliminated. Have you talked to the Kenyans? Have you talked to the South Sudanese and the Burundians and the Rwandans that they are doing the same? If you have not had that conversation, that is the hollow promise. We'll sit here in 2030 and you'll once again promise to eliminate it in 2060. And I'm therefore suggesting to us that in as much as we are looking at the Ugandan situation, it is important to ask ourselves and what are we doing in the East African environment? East African ministers for health meet occasionally one would want to understand the kind of conversation that they engage in. One would want to understand the conversation that the African ministers of health engage in when we are talking about HIV and AIDS. The Uganda 
AIDS Commission is positioned strategically in the office of the president. And my understanding of it is that the presidency in this country has recognized that the impact of HIV AIDS is not only in the health sector, and that it has an impact of an economic kind, it has an impact of a, a political kind, it has an impact of a social kind, and that therefore the president is saying, I want to have a bird's eye view of this particular scourge and give it the kind of prominence that it deserves so that we are able to fight it. And that is what begs and legitimizes the conversation that we are engaged in this morning. How do we deal with the question of funding? But before I come to funding, I was talking about the regional perspective of it, because funding must also have a regional perspective. I've already mentioned the Abuja declaration on how we made commitments to ensure that 15% of our budgets are dedicated to the health sector and therefore by extension, HIV AIDS would also be on radar. What about in the African arena? Many of us are familiar with the African health strategy. If you look at the Africa health strategy, it tells us the, the current version of it, I think, is between the year 2016 and 2030. And the whole idea is that we want and have devised strategies that are going to ensure that we reduce the disease burden. Because if we reduce the disease burden, then we are releasing funds which could then be deployed in other areas which would improve, improve the quality of our people's lives. And if the continental idea and the continental strategy is therefore to ensure that we improve the health sector, what are the structures that are there which are also relevant to the funding arena? Those of you who are doctors will know that we now have centers for disease control with the mother center based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the rest are distributed. I think one is in Nigeria, the other one in Kenya, the other one is in Gabon, and the other one in Egypt, five in total. But who is funding all these things? If you look at African institutions and African initiatives, they are all externally funded up to the extent of 80%. So they are African only in name, but the funding is from outside. And that is why this morning we are wrapping our minds around how we can tackle the question of funding, how we can liberate our donors, because there is a sense in which our donors have also become enslaved by our own lethargy and our inability to release ourselves from dependence. How can we have a strategy where we will transition those of you who are mothers will agree with me. If you have a child who upon being born suckles as he or she should, but at age 40, they are still suckling, you must be very worried about that child. Because that is a sustained state of childhood, which must not be allowed. Africa is such a child at 40 we are still suckling we must now be weaned off the breasts of our donors and we are asking ourselves how are we going to do it what are the different methods i am informed that in uganda your parliament in its wisdom made a decision to create a hiv aids trust fund that was several years ago Africa is never short of good intentions. Africa is never short of good laws. In fact, in Africa, there is a forest of good laws which are honored in breach. So one of the areas in which you could begin talking about populating that fund with money is to activate that fund. Because if you activated that fund, and there are different models, I believe that the private sector can be involved if you gave reasonable tax incentives, 
you are now talking about uh, uh, your oil. It could be that out of the revenue that you are going to generate from that oil is going, I'm told your oil is the, your beginning production in the year 2025, God willing. And if that does happen, then how do you use some of the resources from the re oil revenue? What about the levies that I impose? One of the areas I'm informed that was going to be taxed are the, 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 what, the tax, the sin tax. Those are fellows who have businesses which also have the potential of incubating or creating environments where HIV AIDS can be contracted. You can impose taxes on them, bars and nightclubs and casinos. So that is one avenue, simply activating the fund so that that fund is going to be available for purposes of uh, addressing some of the issues that are confronting us on a daily basis. There are different models. I'm quite certain that if you talk to the private sector, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, the CIPLA, for example, which I see is one of the organizations that is supporting you, what is it that the pharmaceutical companies within the region can do for the country? And within the region, there can also be a deliberate move by each of the East African countries, five in number now. If we donated just 5% of our budget, not our GDP, just the annual budget of each one of the countries into a regional fund, a regional fund to deal with HIV aid. And President Museveni is a champion in this regard. You've got to urge him. Part of the problem that we have in Africa is that we don't sometimes even confront our political leadership. And let me tell you, if politics fails, everything fails, particularly in Africa. The problem is that if whenever we have senior politicians in the room, the professional just coil their tail between their legs and what they engage in is praising those individuals, not saying the right thing. And I, I hope that when, when, when uh, the prime minister was here, I hope you spoke boldly to the prime minister. You've got to learn, we've got to learn to speak boldly. These are human beings, they're just occupying offices, which you too can occupy. And, and if you speak boldly and firmly and respectfully, they are running countries, they want to succeed. And they want to succeed by doing positive things. And I want to imagine that the proceedings of this conference will find its way on the desk of the president, not the executive summary, because the exe executive summary sanitizes things. Let the president read the full blooded deliberations of this particular engagement so that he is capable of appreciating that these are the areas, because how can it be that the program on HIV AIDS is run from the office of the president, and yet the HIV trust fund is not established. When you are talking about the annual milestones, what do you tell the president? That for the last five years, we have had an inactive fund? And how does he think about it? If the president is talking about the parish model, is the parish model not impacted on negatively by HIV AIDS? So that money that ought to go into actual development is then not taken into that arena? I believe that this can be done. The other area where I think is important is that even uh, the, the research institutes in this country, because research is at the very heart of it. You know, I do not know whether sometimes you feel the pain I do when I think about our countries and about our continent. There was COVID here, and we were all wearing masks. Those masks, 90% of them are from China. You are going through tests. The test kits are all from China. And we did not stop there. When the vaccines came, 
all of us who are lining to be vaccinated, we do not know what we are being injected with. By faith, we just believe that it is good. And then we started complaining that we are not being given vaccines. Who should give us? Who owes us a duty? Why can't we produce our own? And I'm saying this because we must also fund research. Many institutions now in East Africa and in Africa, we have research departments. But if you ask many of those individuals who had those institutions, apart from the money that they are given to pay themselves salaries, there is very little money that is available for research. So our researchers have become proposal writing machines. They are either writing a proposal to USID, CEDA Sweden, CEDA Canada. That is all we do. And if you write proposals for too long, you forget every other thing. You become a, an expert in writing proposals and delivering reports to Copenhagen or Oslo or Washington or or London, or Ottawa. Africa must stop that. Africa must stop that. The representative of PEFA will be speaking a little later. I would want to have a conversation with her. When are you leaving? Because she must leave. Because if she does not leave, then we are not going to grow. They mean well for us, but for how long? We must we keep them here? And that is what makes necessary to have a funding system that is going to be useful. And I'm talking about funding research because when you fund research, you will also generate income. You imagine to yourself, and I was telling the good doctor, those who are in the business of uh, innovating and creating the vaccine, they are laughing all the way to the bank. They have made money in the billions. Therefore, they can fund research. Vaccines, HIV AIDS vaccine. We are waiting for Europe and America to, to discover. And meanwhile, we are conferring professorial titles on our research. For what? Professors of what? We must be bold and bland because it is through innovation and invention that we can also generate funds. I, have, I was alive when the ARV debate was going around, when India was defying all those things, when the Chinese were defining. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that some ARVs are made here in Uganda, which is a good thing. But when are we going to run our own pharmaceuticals and engage in research? Because it is the pharmaceuticals that are also giving funds that can support HIV AIDS. So let us look at research and development as an avenue of generating funds and therefore giving us the opportunity of liberating ourselves from the donor funding that we are depending on from the United States of America and, and other sectors. There are also innovative ways of, of dealing with this uh, particular scourge in terms of funding. National health institutions, I know there are quite a number of them, where you ask people to pay money, but you utilize that money. The problem we have in Africa is theft. We have perfected the art of theft. We call it by its Christian name, which is corruption. It is theft on an industrial scale. The Christian name sometimes gives it a veneer of, 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 of wit. But we are, we are thieves. I do not know why. And, and, and we must stop being thieves if, if we are going to fund these initiatives. And, and this is very critical because a lot of money is also lost through the thing that we call corruption. And you now see donors, for example, saying, we are not going to fund government. We are going to fund projects directly. And why do they say that? Because you give $10,000 to a governmental institution, 80% 8 of it will be building a villa somewhere in Uganda. 
or building something somewhere in Nairobi. So they go directly. So we must also ensure that we improve efficient utilization of funds. But I was talking about national health institution in Kenya, National Health Hospital Insurance Fund. How are we funding this? In the Scandinavian countries, you find that taxes reach up to 52% of the income. Why? Because they know that the money is going to the right place at the right moment. If we were to create, to establish national health insurance funds, and we were to strengthen them and to make contribution and to make the case for HIV AIDS, which we desire to eliminate, then we could also create a funding uh, avenue which would liberate us from donor funding, which then begs the question, you practitioners who are here, Many of you are university professors. Some of you are practitioners in hostels. Some of you are researchers. Some of you are working with communities. Today, I want you to ask yourself very nagging questions. Suppose USID were to make a decision tomorrow that they are leaving. Suppose. PEFPA were to make a decision that they are leaving. Suppose UNAIDS were to make a decision that they are leaving them. They have made such decisions in Afghanistan. They did. How would you survive? Have you ever thought about it? I want you this morning to think about that possibility. Because when you think like that, you will wear a cup, a crisis cup. And that is what I'm urging us to think, to think and reason as if we are in a crisis of gigantic proportions so that we begin to ask ourselves, how are we going to fill this void? And I'm suggesting that the time is now that we've got to look at domestic resources. I hope that one of the outcomes of this engagement is that the UN, Uganda AIDS Commission will put together a working party of not more than three. Africans are in the business of appointing commissions of 50 people who never want to finish because of allowances. A working party of not more than three individuals with a set time limit whose only agenda is to ask how are we going to liberate ourselves from donor funding. And the donors must also help us in this regard so that there is a transition. USI, USID and PEFPA must now give us, you give us a notice here in Uganda. Give us a notice that you are leaving in the next three years and with no extension, three years. And help us in the process and the process will also include us give giving us a seed fund because the other problem with donors they also want to keep us in a state of perpetual begging that they never tell you but i'm telling you now they also love it when they keep us in that stage of dependency so give us a seed fund and you can afford it or 50 million dollars and tell us this is the seed money, begin using it and invest it in a manner that will be sustainable. But if you keep on telling us that we will be here for you, God sent us to be useful to you, we will never change and we will never grow. So there must be a transition period where you support us with seed money and we begin to look at our tax regimes in order to fulfill this tax, this gap of funding. As I conclude, so that we enrich this conversation by way of uh, cross fertilization of ideas and thoughts, I am suggesting that fundings must come at various levels. In the first instance, it must be in the domestic arena. Uganda as a country, in the manner that we have already talked about, must find ways and means 
of ensuring that we are able to fund our activities and funding those activities must be understood in the context of overall development. When we talk about sustainable development and we talk about the pillars on health, there is nothing that is going to happen unless we deal with HIV AIDS. When we talk about Africa Agenda 2063 and the pillars on health, we are only going to talk about Africa Agenda 2063 if indeed we are going to have funding. So Uganda must have a Ugandan position. That Ugandan position must now be fed into the East African position. And I want to believe that there are Kenyans here, there are Ugandans here, there are Tanzanians here, and we must have meetings that are reporting meetings because one of the other problems we now have in Africa are annual jamborees, symposia, and all these other things that we hold every year. And then you have a, you have a certificate and you lengthen your CV saying, I attended a conference in Kampala. That is useless. We are attending too many conferences, too many jamborees, which are giving birth to nothing. The next meeting must be a reporting meeting on what we have achieved, not scholarly papers. There's too many scholarly papers, refereed papers. Nobody is reading that nonsense. People are dealing with real issues on the ground. So we can amuse ourselves with scholars by writing peer-reviewed papers in journals. They don't care unless their lives are changing in the parishes. Otherwise, we are not relevant. So I hope that beyond Uganda, there is East Africa. Within the East African region, how do we raise funds? And I've already suggested that we, the means in which we must do so. Beyond East Africa, we must have an African platform. African Union itself, as you know, is also another big beggar, the biggest beggar on earth. 80% of its budget is externally funded, even the CDC. I think the CDC in Africa is funded by the United States of America and modeled after the United States of America CDC. Can't succeed. This idea of mimicking Western institutions in the continent of Africa cannot succeed. And the sooner we realize that in Africa, the safer we are. But remember also that we must come with workable models that borrow from other civilizations. And this is why I like the Chinese, although they are not liked by many. The Chinese have demonstrated to us that you can borrow from Europe, you can borrow from America, and you build your own unique system that works for you. The Indians have also done that. The Japanese have done that. It is only in Africa that we still are laboring under the misguided view that what Europe and America do is what is God ordained. Until we liberate ourselves from that mental slavery, we are going nowhere until the second coming canon. So in the African context, we must also have a model, and that model must go back to the Abuja Declaration of ensuring that we spend at least 15% of our budgets. So in a nutshell, I'm saying, Ugandan model to deal with the domestic arena, the East African model to deal with the East African region because HIV AIDS is cross-border, the African model to deal with the African continent, it is only in that way, ladies and gentlemen, that we will make our supporters to support us with respect. There will always be support and Europe and America owes us. Actually, they must be told. Sometimes we don't tell them. They owe us, but they must do so in dignity and in a sustainable manner. We must make support to us dignified. As I conclude, I want to ask you this question. If you run your household, you are husband, you are wife, you have children, you are adult males and females of sound mind supposedly, 
And on a daily basis, the food that you consume in your house is shipped to you by a friend of goodwill. Do you think that friend of goodwill respects you? They may be polite to you, but do they? They don't. And should they? They shouldn't. I'm suggesting to you that until the day we wean ourselves, all these will continue to happen to us and nobody is going to respect us. I'm now speaking to you fellow Africans. Nobody. You may have your PhDs. You may have your professorships. You may have big titles. But when they go out in Europe and America and they sit in their rooms, I want to imagine to myself what they say. They'll soon be coming here on a begging spree. And even when you are holding a decent conversation, they are waiting for you to do what brought you, beg. Let us stop it here and now. God bless you. You may ask you such questions as you desire. Thank you very much. I'm a king, yes, I'm a king, I think I'm a king, king.